I'm happy to see that you're with us again tonight, and uh, I hope the weatherman is wrong about the forecast. I'm still a little uncertain about what might happen here, but uh, maybe we'll not get any snow, and maybe we'll have a beautiful week this week, although uh, a few people here are probably wishing for some snow. But uh, it's good to see you tonight. Hope you have a great week this week. Uh, hope... You'll be a little bit sweeter to your spouse this week and uh, throughout the rest of, of your days here. Two lessons left in the book of James. Tonight uh, might perhaps be one of our more interesting studies because of a certain passage in, in or a certain verse in the passage. But uh, tonight we want to talk about prayer and praise. And certainly, as James is concluding his epistle here, he is calling these Christians to prayer and to praise and encouraging them to do that. That was common uh, with the epistles as, as these individuals would write letters to different congregations or to different individuals. Oftentimes there was a call or an exhortation to do something at the end of the letter and that is the case here. It just so happens that James is encouraging them to pray and to praise God. And so that's what we'll deal with tonight. Um, we, we find this call to pray and to sing praises with guidance as what to do, not only what to do, but when to do it. For instance, in the first place, James says in verse 13, in times of suffering, pray. Look at verse 13 of James 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. So he tells them what to do and when to do it. If you're suffering in life, you need to stop and pray about it. Certainly, as we've seen throughout this epistle, the Christians to whom James was writing were suffering people. It's almost as if Psalm 73 was directly applicable to these Christians who themselves as saints of God were suffering immensely in life and yet, on the other hand, they looked out into the world and saw the sinners who were being successful, who were living, uh, you know, great lives in the world. And so, they were suffering. Well, what kind of suffering is James exactly referring to here? The word used refers to really suffering of any kind, whether we're talking about sickness or bereavement, disappointment, persecution, loss of health, property, prosperity, so on and so on. Any kind of suffering in life is what James is talking about. Later in our passage tonight, James is going to narrow that down and deal with one area of suffering, and that is sickness. We'll get there in just a few moments. But what exactly should we pray for when we're suffering? If James is telling them to pray when they are suffering, certainly it would be helpful to know what to pray for, wouldn't it? And thankfully, the Bible answers that question for us. For instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8, it seems that Paul prayed to have his suffering removed. And certainly, I believe that is acceptable to God, although he may not grant that request. You remember Paul recalled how he had a thorn in the flesh. We, we really don't know necessarily what that was, but some kind of ailment or some kind of something that caused him suffering in life. And he says in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 8, Consider this thing that I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Well, if you remember how the story goes, Paul then uh, tells the Corinthian brethren how God told him, My grace is sufficient for you. And so on that particular occasion, the, the request wasn't granted to Paul, but still he prayed for that. So it's an acceptable thing to pray for the suffering to be removed. But also we ought to pray for strength to endure the suffering, if it be the will of God that we have to bear it. Sometimes it is His will that we suffer. I, I don't necessarily know the answer all the time why that is the case. Sometimes our suffering is is definitely for our benefit to help us grow in the faith, to strengthen our faith and, and to put our, our trust in God more than we have before. Maybe not always, but sometimes. But uh, Paul again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 mentions the fact of God's faithfulness 
who will not suffer you to be tempted beyond that you're able, but will also with the temptation make a way of escape. And so it seems that he's indicating that we need to look for that way of escape and, and to, to look for strength and guidance to make it through our sufferings. And so those are at least two things that we can pray for in our sufferings. Now I mentioned that God may not always grant the request to remove the sufferings. The psalmist is a good example of that. For instance, in Psalm 119, verse 67, the writer says, Behold, or excuse me, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. And if you follow the thoughts throughout Psalm 119, in verse 71, he says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. And then further down in verse 75, he says, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. And so the writer David apparently understood that his suffering was for a greater good in his life. And often that is the case with us. Now it's hard to view it that way, isn't it? If we're being honest with ourselves, it's very difficult to view our suffering that way. That is for our benefit, but sometimes that is the case. Well then for whom should we pray? We, we know the kind of suffering he's talking about. We know what we should pray for, but who should we pray for? Now, again, specifically James is talking about those Christians dealing with suffering. But let's broaden that out a little bit and just ask the question, since the passage is about prayer, who should we pray for? Well, certainly, number one, we need to pray for ourselves as is implied above. If you're suffering, pray. That's a prayer for yourself. Number two, we need to pray for those who might be the source of our suffering. You know, in, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 28, Matthew 5 and verse 44, Jesus said, pray for those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Pray for them. Have you ever prayed for someone who was causing you suffering? I'm not talking about praying that they would quit causing you suffering necessarily, but pray for them, that God could help them, that He could touch their heart. Certainly God can do that. What else should, or who else should we pray for? To keep from making this list extremely long, let's just turn to, to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 3, where Paul instructs Timothy to pray for all men. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Pray for all men. Listen to, to his words. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he lists some of those men. For kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And so we have two more categories here. The first one is those who are in authority. People like our, our councilmen. It would be good for us to pray for our city councilmen here, wouldn't it? County commissioners, governors and things like that. But all the way up to our president, pray for these people. We need to pray for them that they can continue to allow us, as Paul said to Timothy, to live a godly and a peaceable life. But all men, pray for everyone. Now, I wouldn't suggest you try to pray for all men in a single prayer. <laughs> I believe it's good in our prayers to be specific. Tell God what we want, what we need. Be specific in your prayers. But don't ever be afraid or shy away from praying from someone, anyone. Pray for all men. And so in times of suffering, pray. It's a wonderful privilege to pray, a great source of comfort when we're afflicted. Well, next we learn from James that not only in times of suffering should we pray, but also in verse 13 he says, Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. When you're happy, when you're... In times of cheer, sing praise. The word cheerful there denotes a state of pleasantness, uh, agreeableness with others and with yourself. It suggests a state of mind that is free from trouble, the opposite of affliction, happiness. 
And so we have two extremes here. On the one extreme, James says, when you're suffering, pray. And he goes all the way to the other extreme and says, when you're cheerful, pray. What does that tell you about all the times in between? Pray. <laughs> You've got to, to pray when you're, when you're suffering, pray when you're cheerful, pray all the time. Doesn't that echo the sentiment of Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing? Certainly. Christians ought to be a people of prayer. Prayer should be your desire each and every day of your life. But you see, in such a state of happiness, sing praises. Singing praises is becoming of God's people. I want to read a few verses from the Psalms, and if you're taking notes, you might just write these down because I'm going to go through them quickly. But just listen to the attitude of the psalmist in some of these Psalms. Psalm 96, verses 1 and 2 he says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Psalm 101, verse 1, I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord, I will sing praises. Psalm 111, and verse 1, Sing praise to the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Psalm 113, verses 1 through 3. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Psalm 146, verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. And so you see, the psalmist, as a child of God, presumably David, was a man of Singing praise to God. How often do you sing praises to God? When you're cheerful, do you find yourself singing praises to God? Well, maybe, maybe not. But it's a great thing to do, and it's a biblical thing to do, a very scriptural thing to do that is becoming of Christians. David was a man after God's own heart, and, and he wanted to, God to know how he felt about him. And so he constantly and continually sing, sang praises to God. For singing praises has the power to make a good situation even better. You know, we have some instruction in, in the Bible about singing. In Ephesians 5.18 and Colossians 3.16, those old familiar verses that go something like this, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And Colossians 3.16 says something very similar. But have you ever stopped to notice that the context of those passages is not in the worship assembly? I don't have a problem applying those passages to the worship assembly, but those passages are about our everyday life. Christians ought to sing praise to God. Why don't some Christians sing praises more often and more fervently, you might wonder? Are they that afflicted? Are they so suffering that they're not cheerful, therefore they can't sing praises? Well, perhaps. Hasn't God done enough in our lives to prompt us to <coughs> praise Him fervently and in song? Well, certainly the answer to that one is yes. What excuse could we give then for refusing to praise God for His glory and His goodness in that great avenue that God has given to us called singing? We cannot use the excuse that we can't sing. God commands all of us to sing, and unless we are mute, the command applies to us. Fortunately, God isn't concerned with how it sounds. The fact is, all of us can sing, some better than others, but God isn't concerned about how it sounds. I've often said, I know you're familiar with the man Johnny Cash, I believe Johnny Cash was probably, well, I won't say one of the worst sounding singers of his day, but he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. But he made millions of dollars doing it, didn't he? And you might not be able to carry a tune in, the, in a bucket, but, but God still wants you to sing to him. When you're cheerful, sing praises to God. It doesn't have to be a song from our songbook. Make something up. Praise God for what He's done for you in your life. You know, heaven is described by John in the book of Revelation as 
a place where singing praises to God and to Christ is an ongoing, as we might look at it, an everyday activity. That's what heaven's going to be like. Praising God, worshiping Him, loving Him, singing to His name. And if we don't sing praises to God on earth, though we're able to, can we really expect to be allowed to do that in heaven? Just something to think about. When you're suffering, pray. When you're cheerful, sing praises. Singing praises is just as important as praying. Perhaps our prayers might be answered more often the way we would like if we praise God more often as He desires. Now the rest of our text and the rest of our time this evening is going to be spent with the rest of these verses, verse 14 through 18. And admittedly, it can be a difficult passage, but let's look at, at it. Beginning in verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, admittedly, this passage is difficult, okay? Questions abound concerning this passage. Is, is the sickness a physical sickness or a spiritual sickness? Is the anointing with oil a medicinal kind of thing or is it more of a symbolic thing? Is the healing that God promises here through providential means or is it a miraculous healing? Is the healing spiritual or is it physical? First of all, I believe this passage is dealing with the, the sickness and healing in this passage is physical. I believe there's ample evidence for that if you just look at the text. Though spiritual needs here are taken into consideration, the, the healing and the sickness is physical in nature. That's in view of the phrase later on down in verse 15 where he says, If he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. And so there's a separation here between the physical problem and the spiritual problem. And so the sickness and the healing is a physical kind of thing. With the assumption that physical illness here is being discussed, there are two feasible explanations of this passage. This question has probably been asked to me more than any other since I've been involved in ministry. Should we do this today? When you're sick, do you need to call for the elders of the church? Do they bring a bottle of oil over and anoint you with oil? Is James commanding this to be done? in the Christian age. Well, the, let's think about the two explanations. The first explanation is that perhaps this is talking about a miraculous healing. The elders, as proponents of this position say, possess the gift of miraculous healing. The anointing with oil then would have been symbolic and, and would have represented the presence of the Holy Spirit and His involvement in the healing. And certainly that was the case and, and anointing people with oil was used that way. You remember when they anointed the kings back in the Old Testament with oil, that's what that, it was a symbolic kind of thing representing God's presence and the Holy Spirit's presence with that person. The second view of the passage then is this, that the passage is referring to providential healing where the elders were called because they were likely the most righteous people in the congregation. The anointing with oil then would have been a medicinal kind of thing as was commonly used in that day. The healing, again, would have been providential. Now you say, how do you know that oil was used that way? Number one, history tells us that. Um, olive oil, for instance, has very much medicinal purposes. In Luke chapter 10, as Jesus is telling the story of the Good Samaritan, do you remember the Good Samaritan stopped by and, and saw that individual lying on the side of the road and he picked him up and he cared for him? 
But the words of Luke chapter 10 and verse 34 are telling for us. It says, So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Pouring in oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him there. And that tells me that even in the Bible times, oil was used medicinally. I lean toward the latter explanation for a few different reasons. The first explanation assumes that all elders had the gift of miraculous healing. And I don't think we can make that assumption. The Bible doesn't teach that, and certainly it was not a qualification of an elder to have that gift to be in that office. We have no record of that in the New Testament. And so in illustrating the effectiveness of prayer, James uses an example of God providentially answering prayer. He goes and he looks at the instance where Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain. He goes back again and he prays that it would rain and it did rain. And there was nothing miraculous about that. God was using the uh, natural forces, natural processes to answer the prayer of Elijah. It was a providential, providentially answered prayer. God was answering pray, Elijah's prayer, but he did so providentially. And so I believe that's what it is. You know... They would call for the elders of the church. The elders, as James says, would, would pray over them, pray for them, pray to God that God could providentially heal them. And then as much as they could, they would help with the defect or the illness, the sickness, whatever it was, by putting oil on whatever it was. I think that's the explanation of the passage. With that understanding, let's make some application. Number one, in our physical times of sickness, we ought to do the same today. Why wouldn't you want the elders here to pray for you in your times of sickness? Presumably, they should be among the most righteous in the church today, wouldn't you think? Why wouldn't you want them to pray for you? I don't know about you, but I, if, if I'm sick, I want them praying for me. I want all of you to pray for me, but I especially want them to pray for me. You want the prayers of the righteous working on your behalf, don't you? I want you to notice something, though. James says that you are to call for them. Is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. I've heard stories and seen sometimes in ministry, people get upset because... The elders didn't call and check on them. The preacher didn't call and check on them. Nobody called and checked on them, but guess what? Nobody knew you were sick. Here the responsibility lies with the afflicted person. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't call and check on people. That's a good thing to do. But when you're sick, you ought to call somebody so we can pray for you, if nothing else. Have the elders pray with you. James says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Number two, not only should we call for the elders and let them pray with us and for us, but the elders of the church should not only pray, but see that appropriate medical aids are provided. Now, in a century where hospitals were non-existent and physicians were very rare, anointing with oil was a very common treatment. Again, we illustrated that by looking at the Good Samaritan. That was a very common treatment. But you see, in our present country, that would involve the elders making sure that the sick receive the treatment they need. Number three, the sick need to confess their sins. You know, sometimes our physical sicknesses, our physical illnesses, can be a result of our sin. That's not always the case, certainly. But sometimes it is the case. Even if it's not the case, maybe when you were sick or ill, we have sin in our life. Well, James here calls for us to confess our sins and to repent of our sins. Verse 16 and, and other verses like it suggest that illness might be God's loving chastisement for sin in an effort to guide us back home to Him. For instance, uh, 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 through 32. Paul is talking, of course, about, uh, you know, meats offered to idols and so forth. And uh, he transitions then into the Lord's Supper. And he says in verse 29, He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment upon himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And then listen to his next statement. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. And what I gather from that is that because of our sin in our life, sometimes God chastens us with physical illness. Again, not always, but sometimes. Friends, however you interpret James 5, verses 14 to 16, there's no dispute over the main thrust of the passage. Prayer and praise is what James was getting at. How's your prayer life? How's your praise life? Are you praising God? Are you praying to Him? These are very special privileges for the Christian. And there's not a time in our life when we shouldn't be doing one or the other. We must be careful not to underestimate, friends, the power of praise, the power of prayer, and the importance of both. But to truly benefit from those two spiritual exercises, we need to be in a right relationship with God, which involves being open to His Word. The wise man says in Proverbs 28 and verse 9, He who turns away his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Not only does it involve being open to God's Word, but being a doer of the Word. Matthew 7 and verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And if you're not willing to do those two things, friends, prayer and praise will not be effective for you. Let me ask you again, how's your prayer life tonight? How's your praise life? Are you talking to God? Are you praising Him for everything He's done for you? If not, you ought to correct that tonight. Come back to God on His terms. Get in a right relationship with Him. Start praying to Him and praising Him. It will bless your life. If you have that need tonight or any other need at all, if you come and let us know, we do anything in our power to help you. We'll pray with you and for you. We'll study with you if that's your need. Whatever you need, we're ready and able to assist. Let us know as we stand and sing. On behalf of the Lawnville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come and experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity to learn about God and to become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or for more information, please visit our website at www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you, and we hope you have a blessed day.